Today we are going to demonstrate how to properly install an SST2 hydraulic bifold door. We've set up a door how this is how it's going to be packed. This is how this is how most of them are going to arrive to your site on a flatbed truck. Uh, packed up pretty much just like this. Uh, sometimes bigger doors will be packed a little different. Uh, small doors sometimes can be fully assembled, but for the most part, this is how it's going to look. Um, and you're also going to get a pallet that'll have a couple boxes on it, be all your parts. Uh, the pump, the hoses, you know, everything, everything else you need. So the first thing you're going to want to do when the truck arrives is go through and make sure you have everything that you're supposed to have. You can have a packing list and just open up your boxes, take all your parts out, make sure it's all there. And the first thing you want to do is grab this folder, which is your install manual and your wiring diagram and everything we do today will be in the install manual if you have any questions. The other thing we tend to see is seals get lost for whatever reason um, so put those in a safe place. I don't know why that happens but we get a lot of calls and seals just seem to walk off the job site. Okay, now it's time to take the door off the truck. Um, the door we got today is a, is a, is a pretty short one, so uh, a regular forklift works real good for this. That's not always the case. Sometimes uh, you may need an extended boom type lift and, and straps, uh, but today forks reach under this door perfect, so that's what we're using. So he's going to come in, pick it up, and then you're going to, ideally, if this is an exterior wall, you're going to put the, this side towards your rough opening, just anywhere out in front of it. One thing that uh, I need to mention now is, is very important. Um, you, your door is going to be painted, powder coated or primed. Do not always protect the paint with foam or cardboard, um, especially the powder coating. If it's it, the the few minutes you take protecting the powder coating is pennies compared to trying to fix it after it's been scratched. So do not let steel tools or forks touch the paint directly. Always, always protect the paint. Um, even straps can scuff it. So very important. You, the, the more care you take will r really pay off. Moving on, this is what, um, this is kind of the next step now. We got it laid down, folded out. We're going to pull off this, your, your aluminum retainer for your seals will be laying here. Another thing that always seems to go missing, so put that in a safe place. And then we're just going to now pull the jam legs off bolt them on yeah, so we can lift this up into the hole all in one piece. So this is a, our, the typical jam leg for an SST2 and it just has three bolts in the top of it to attach it to the, the angle header piece <clears throat> and when you get it they'll, they'll be installed in the hole. So you just got to take them out, line up the holes, put the bolts in, tighten them down, uh, and that's pretty much it for the top. You're going to make sure the roller is in the track and then before you lift you got to make sure you tie 
the door panel to the jamling, otherwise um, it, it would, it's just going to fall. You'll see that in the video, how we do that. We do, we do a C-clamp, uh, but you know, if you do that, just make sure, again, you're protecting the paint. Okay, doors hanging, ready to go into the rough opening. Um, we kind of mocked up a wood rough opening here. It can be anything, uh, steel, concrete, uh, metal studs. Um, we're just doing wood because uh, it's easy to drill through and you know, speed up that process. We're going to assume that your rough opening is square and your, your floor or countertop is level, your header's level. Um, this door is designed for the bottom of the jam tube to rest on the finished floor elevation or the countertop. Then that will leave you with a, uh, a three quarter inch gap under the door panel. So just keep that in mind when you're setting the door. We've had, we've had instances where that, that's, got, that's got missed. Um, flooring has gone, that, that got, the door got set, flooring went in after, and now you've, um, your gap under your door is is a problem. At this point you can take off the clamps or the straps or whatever you got this tight on and drive it in and uh, set it down. Once we do that we'll go from there. Okay, doors in the hole. It's setting on finished floor or countertop. Now you want to first step center the top uh, and then once you've got that we're going to fasten the, the top two corners. Okay, doors in, top two corners are bolted or welded, uh, whatever your application is. Um, now, the next step is, 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 is bolting the, the leg in, but before you do that, you gotta make sure that this gap is is even all the way down so and it it should be a half an inch so when before you get that bottom bolt in that should be the first, the next bolt right here get this gap at a half inch uh, or it even it doesn't hurt to be just a hair more than that Okay, now that after you've got the, the jams bolted on, uh, you saw we were using lag bolts there. That's not what you're going to be using. We're just doing that to, for the demonstration to speed things up. This does, ne it needs to be through bolts. Uh, so just FYI. So after your, your legs are bolted on, you're ready to bolt the rest of the, the header on. On wider doors, there is potential for a little bit of sag. So before you start bolting that header on, uh, you need to sight down it and either with the forks or blocks, uh, shim it up so that it is uh, level across the top. Once you get that done, go ahead, finish the rest of the, the bolting or welding.
Okay, doors in, hard parts done. And that, that's not so bad, right? Uh, now it's time to uh, lay out hoses and install cylinders. Hoses are laid out. Um, it's easy just to do it on the floor. Uh, uncoil them, get all the twist out. You've got a red set and you've got a blue set. Um, that'll make a little more sense the further along we go here. But the one thing you got to figure out before we put this up in the hose tray is you can see that there's a direction here uh, with this elbow and you want this hose here pointing or going towards the side that the power unit's on. So our power unit's going to be on this side. We've got it uh, with this hose going that direction. Now, if your power unit is maybe above the door towards the center of it, you can take this elbow out and the hose can go directly onto this T fitting and just come straight up out of the hose tray. And it'll look a lot better, you won't have the big bend. Hoses are in. Uh, make sure that after you get them in this hose tray that you, the, they're centered. You've got the same amount of tail sticking out on both sides here. After that's done, uh, time to put in hydraulic cylinder. Uh, the main pin here, this upper one, does come installed. Uh, you don't have to dig that one out of the box. And that is simply a uh, just a keeper pin here and it'll pull right out. This end can go up in there, um, pinned in. Th every, these connections are maintenance free. So no grease on this pin or this pin. There is a, a maintenance free bushing uh, right here and then there is a maintenance free bushing right there. Cylinders are in, top pin only. We're going to leave the, the bottom one loose for now. Um, make sure when you put this back in that this keeper pin goes in top down. Uh, we're going to leave the hoses hanging loose for now. You can see now why we've got things color coded. Um, these colored caps will come on the fittings like that so that. Uh, we don't get those mixed up. And now it's time to bleed uh, and purge uh, lines and cylinders. So let's go to the pump. So here's the power unit. Uh, this is actually a, a newer power unit for us. Um, well, I know a lot, of you, a lot of you guys have not seen this yet. We kind of have improved on cleaning up a little bit. It's got a cover that you'll see go on later, but fits over all the, all the valving and the, the electric components. Um, <clears throat> I'm not gonna get much into the, the electrical. It just varies too much from job to job. You're just gonna wanna get your, the, the schematic that comes with, and that's gonna tell you how uh, you should be hooking up um, your electric. 
So you can see we've got a red and a blue fitting here. And of course that just correlates with the hoses. So this is where your, the two A, we call them the A and B hoses, well the blue and the red anyway, have to get to the pump. Um, and then we're just gonna hook them up. We're gonna fill it with fluid and ready to purge. Most of the time just regular hydraulic fluid is fine. The only time you need to think about anything different is if it's a really cold application. If you're running it regularly below 30 degrees, you're gonna wanna use ATF. Okay, power unit is, uh, hoses are hooked up, uh, electrician has hooked the power up, it's running, uh, don't, don't check that too much once you put fluid in it. Now it's now time to bleed hoses. So you can tighten these fittings down now. Uh, they do ship loose, so don't forget to tighten these down. And they're gonna be kind of pointed like this is the way you want them. Red hose can now go on tight. and we're gonna bleed the blue hose first. Time to bleed the blue hose. We've got oil in the tank. This is about four gallons. Uh, that should be enough for, for these cylinders to, uh, to purge. It does vary. I, it's a question we get all the time, how much fluid are we going to need? Uh, it varies. The, the cylinder sizes can be much bigger than this, so you would need more fluid. Um, you know, sometimes up to seven gallons. So, to bleed the blue line, we want to hit the open button or switch. And do not get this confused. That turns this simple process into a messy one if you do. So we've got the blue lines loose, caps out, buckets under them. I am just gonna run this until we've got clear fluid running out of the end of the blue line. <laughs> Okay, blue line purged, hooked up, tightened. Uh, I now need to address one problem we always see with pictures or videos of installations um, is twist in hoses. There is a specific way to tighten these, and as you can see, this one here looks good, nice and smooth, no twist to it. That is because you, you hold this side right here. You're holding the hose from twisting while you're tightening this nut. If you don't do that, your hoses will start to look like that. And what happens, there, the two things, it looks bad and the big issue is the hose is now loaded where it wants to loosen uh, the fitting and it will over time. So very important. Get that, get the hose laying naturally without any twist or torque in it. Hold that side, hold that side while you're tightening that nut. That's how it should look. Um, also, 
one more thing. You, all, all of the connections, all the hydraulic connections we have, do not need any kind of thread tape or sealer. They are a flanged fitting, um, just, just tight, and you shouldn't have any leaks. Blue lines purged, hooked up to the cylinder, fittings are tight. We are now going to run it in open and extend the cylinders. You want to, when you're doing this, you want to make sure that you're holding out the bottom because this is, this is coming down and it's coming down with some force. So whatever this hits has got potential to do some damage. So make sure that area is clear and we are going to run it until both cylinders are fully extended. Cylinders uh, extended. Now time to bleed the red hose. So we're going to take it off, but this is where we're going to start to see some fluid. So you're going to want to have rags handy here and take this loose slowly. There, there is going to be a little oil here. Um, once you've got that done, this is going to go into your bucket. We will bleed that with the close mode now. Once we've got clear fluid coming out, we're going to hook it back up, tighten it up. Bleeding's done. The one thing you got to watch for when you're bleeding the red hose is this these cylinders are tested. They have fluid in them already. So that has backed up into this hose a little bit. So you're going to see some fluid right away. Don't stop. You need to get past that. Um, so, so make sure you're, you're getting clear fluid, no air bubbles before you stop and hook that back up. Good. Okay. All right, cylinders are extended, hose is hooked up, everything's purged, all the air is out of everything as much as we can get it. Time to hook the, the lower pin onto the door. Uh, this ram is, is still fully extended. Uh, you can see that when this end is not captured that this, this does rotate a little bit. Um, once it's running, you can turn this. Actually, I can turn it by hand right now. This adjustment clevis here needs to be to the inside when the pin gets in. This is the pin. It's got a groove for the snap ring on both ends. Go ahead and put one side in. It's going to go in this way. Once it's in uh, and the, both of them are hooked up, we can push the door open and put the other snap ring in from the outside. You will get one of these uh, in, your, in your box, so you don't have to worry about having the right the right tool for this. Okay, all of our hydraulic work is pretty much done now. Um, and this is where you want to check the fluid level. Uh, we, we never added any after we initially did, so we used this much in the purging process. This is actually more than you need. If this level was down here, you would be fine. This reservoir 
for the most part, has more capacity than, than you need. Rarely are you going to, it would be a big door with big cylinders where you're going to need to be up in this range. So if you end up with a level down in here, you're, you're totally fine. You'll know if you don't have enough fluid in there, the door will not go up all the way and you will hear uh, gurgling or sucking air inside that tank if you don't have enough fluid. So now we're, the next step is to uh, run it. It's ready to run. Uh, put two, three cycles on it, make sure everything's running fine. Uh, that will also kind of get out any small air bubbles we got floating around in the lines. Here we go. All right, uh, door's running good. Everybody's happy. Time to apply uh, seals. This is what your side seal is going to look like. Uh, might not be this color, but this is what it's going to look like. And it's going to come uh, in a long length that has to be cut to fit. It's going to go the full length of this jam tube. Um, and what you're going to do, it, it's going to have pre-punched holes. You're going to have a screw that kind of looks like this. This tube is, is usually 3 16 so it's, it's heavy. You have to pre-drill. And that info on that uh, drill bit size is in the install manual. But you're going to take, once you get to the, this cut to size, you are going to set it up here, and door does need to be closed tight. You set it up here until it's hitting the back of the door, and then you're going to push it forward until you've got a little bit of compression on that bulb seal. And that's where it goes. Drill your, ho your holes, screw it in, and uh, that's done. And now we'll move on to uh, the bottom seal. Uh, side seals are on, time for bottom seal. That is this piece right here. Uh, it's just an aluminum retainer. Uh, it, it receives a, uh, a typical garage door type rubber T seal, which we will put on later. Um, this goes on the very bottom of the door panel on this tube. Uh, at about right here. We want three quarters of an inch from the front face to the edge of the retainer and then we want a half inch gap from the jam tube to the to that edge of the retainer because remember this side seal will be in there and we do not want those rubbing. Um, that's the screw. You should not have to pre-drill anything. That is a self-tapping screw right there. And it will go in the center of that channel at uh, 12 inches on center. Now, once that's on, you, there's an easy way to put the rubber in. This is not the, the position you want to put the rubber in. And we will show you that next. Okay, time for top seal. Uh, you have to do this with the door in the open position. This is it. You're just going to get a big roll of this. It's just a, rub, a rubber a double bulb seal, adhesive back. 
Uh, we use this at the top and at the middle. Um, you're going to want to cut the f cut this the full length of the door panel and clean the surface before you stick it on. And your goal here is to have the back of the door close to flush with the uh, this side of the uh, seal. So peel the paper off, stick it on. Simple as that. Time for mid seal. Same material as the top. You are going to cut it the width of the door panel and apply it flush with the back of the door. Just like that. And again, make sure you clean that surface first. We're going to show you the easy way to put the bottom rubber in. Uh, the retainer should be on at this point. And what we're going to do is take this plate off right here. This is the roller access plate. It is, it is not there just to put rubber in. It is there for if you ever have to access the roller to inspect it or replace it. And we're just going to take those off raise the door, let the rollers come out of the track, um, raise the door all the way up and you'll see uh, it brings the retainer up, easy spot to work on and easy to put the rubber in. One thing we see a lot of is that this rubber does not get cut at the right length. What you're shooting for here is to get this edge flush with the side seal. So that's just going to take a little bit of uh, a little bit of trimming to get that perfect. The other thing is what you don't want to do is do a lot of of stretching and pushing. You you while you're getting that final length, you want this rubber in that channel, kind of in its natural state, not being bunched up or stretched out. Doors running, seals are on. There are some, we're not done. A lot of guys think we're done, but you're not done. There's some, there's a one very important final adjustment that needs to be made, but it does have to be made after the, the covering is on the door um, or, or all the weight. That's what I'm getting at. And that's the relief valve, which is right here. So with all hydraulic systems, there, there's a relief valve and, and, and that's pretty much determines the PSI of the of what the pump will put out. The, usually the pump without the weight of glass or any other covering, uh, the pump will will run the door fine. You'll think everything is 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 good to go. Well, but in reality the pump is is at overkill. Um, it's pushing more PSI than we need. But once you put the glass and all the weight on it, that's when you really know if the relief valve is set right. So to do that, we are going to take the Allen wrench, we'll loosen this lock nut right here. I don't know if I did that already. I did that. Counterclockwise, lowers the PSI. So what would happen is if we just kept turning it down is the door would not raise or it would it would raise halfway and stop. Which is 
kind of how you're going to set it. You're going to back that off until that happens. Once that happens, once the door is not going up all the way, you are going to start turning it back clockwise and you're going to start increasing the, the, the PSI pump of the pump. Once the door is reaching full open without going over the relief, and you can hear it when that happens, there, there usually is kind of a noise, maybe a little bit of a whistle when fluid is going over the relief valve. You don't necessarily want that. You want to keep turning that in until that goes away. That's your setting. The reason we do this, this is a safety factor. The reason we do that is because if we had this relief valve cranked all the way in and, and we're pumping 2,000 PSI, door would run fine. You would have no idea that, that the, the pump was running at way more PSI than we needed until something would happen like an obstruction either under the door or out in front of the door, that's when, that's when we don't want that extra PSI. You're, now you're going to do much more damage than, than you need to be doing because it's pushing that much harder. So that's why that's a very important setting and that needs to be done on every, every power unit. Manual letdown feature, that is this knob right here. This is for lowering the door without electrical power. And it's, uh, it's very simple. You just turn it counterclockwise. A little bit doesn't take much. Gravity brings the door down. It, will, it, won't, it won't ever come shut tight. Uh, it's just going to come down as far as gravity will bring it. Once it's to that point, tighten that back up, it's ready to run. So one of the things we hate to see when we get pictures or videos of uh, a nice installation, the one thing that can ruin a good installation, I think, is messy hoses. And we touched on it before with, with not getting these fittings t tightened down right, putting some load in, and getting some coil into the hoses here. And, and on bigger doors, you'll actually have a lot more hose here and it, it can look a lot worse. So you could do just an amazing job everywhere else on this door, uh, getting a perfect install and you could have a coiling mess of hoses and just ruin everything. So this is a, this is, these are perfect right here. Laying naturally, no coil in them. And uh, we send zip ties with for this purpose. Just a couple zip ties, get them cleaned up real nice. There, just a nice finishing touch, we think makes, it makes all the difference in a nice looking install. One thing I need to touch on is, uh, for you installers, one thing you need to be prepared for is, this baby with fluid runs about 100 pounds. So, wherever you're mounting that, however you're doing that, you gotta, that's 100 pounds, so, you do have four half inch holes. It is 16 inch on center holes. Uh, just something to keep in mind. SST2 hydraulic bifold installation in a nutshell. Uh, this, a lot of this applies to the single swing as well. Um, really the only difference is the bifold has a bottom panel. The single swing does not. So if you're installing a single swing, everything we went through pretty much applies to the single swing. Um, this was our standard 
installation method with the mounting flanges um, around the three sides. They're not all going to be like that. Um, we, we do a couple different ones, um, but you, I mean, you get the gist of it. Um, I do want to reiterate that all of the fasteners for that frame would normally be through bolts. Uh, we, we threw a couple through bolts in here just to show you. Um, and the rest we did lag bolts. You are not going to be using lag bolts. Uh, we'll all, everything will be through bolts. You will get a couple other things in the, uh, the box, touch up paint. Um, just a, 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 you know, just a couple other odds and ends to help you uh, finish it. But uh, I think we covered the important parts and if you got questions, feel free to call. <laughs>